every 45 seconds, someone dies in an alcohol-related crash. Here today, we have two survivors to tell us their story. Our interviewees today are Heidi Funk and Vince Olstead. In recent years, they have both been involved in alcohol-related crashes. For victims of alcohol-related crashes, their day started out like any other. Can you tell us what you did the day of the accident? So the day of the accident, um, my husband and I had gone into St. Cloud to go Christmas shopping, and we were on our way home. It was June 2nd of 2009, the youngest son, Kyle, had just graduated from high school nine days before this, and uh, his baseball team had gone to the state tournaments that year, and so the next evening they were going to get together for a season and do a barbecue and picnic. I really wanted to be back for that, so uh, I knew it was going to be a late day, but uh, that was the way I loved to do things, I guess. The realization of the crash can come hours or days after the occurrence. What was your first reaction after the crash? You know, I have no memory of the crash that night, so the first thing that I remember actually took place probably about five weeks later. Uh, it was a head-on collision with another three-quarter ton pickup, so I really have no memory. I have no memory of that night. I have no memory of realizing that there was a vehicle coming at me, that I'm going to be in a head-on collision. Uh, the first recollection that I have actually um, was probably about four weeks later on about the 25th or 26th of June is hearing this news coverage, constant news coverage of the death of Michael Jackson. But I couldn't put together what's going on. And it was at that point then, then again, I could recognize I was laying down someplace, no memory. I was told by my family and my doctors I had been involved in a vehicle accident and I was in the hospital. According to the emergency responders, I was still conscious when they arrived on the scene. I had been pinned in my pickup and they had to cut me out of my pickup to get me out, but uh, I have no memory of it. So. Well, it was late and I had to work early in the morning, so I had leaned my seat back to fall asleep on the way home and um, I actually don't remember the crash at all, um, being asleep. So the first thing I remember is waking up in the hospital. Once they comprehend the tragedy that they were involved in, their grief becomes a reality. Their crashes have affected their lives in many ways and that day will never be forgotten. What do you remember from the hours after the accident? Most of what I remember is really things that I've been told because I was unconscious for so long. Um, I've been told that I was extracted from the trunk of the car. Um, I heard stories about, you know, the things that um, kind of transpired in the emergency room. Um, but the first thing I remember is waking up and seeing um, my mom on one side of me and my mother-in-law on the other side of me. And I knew right away that something was really wrong because why would my mother-in-law be standing there and not with her son? And that's when I realized even before they told me that Bill had died. What was your road to recovery? Um, my road to recovery basically started probably about an hour later. Uh, there was a number of motorists that stopped to offer assistance uh, uh, and uh, the emergency responders from Kidder County arrived on the scene, I'm guessing within probably 45 minutes or an hour. Uh, by the time they got me cut out of the vehicle and uh, into the ambulance and headed into uh, Bismarck, the bones and kidneys had already started to shut down. I lost a lot of blood and well, quite frankly the doctors did not expect me to make it through the night. Uh, and since then, they've told me that for about the first two weeks that I was in the emergency room that they had assigned me a 5% probability of surviving. Um, I had a lot of internal injuries, uh, the left side of my body from about halfway up my chest to about halfway down my, uh, between my uh, waist and my knee was uh, ripped open, uh, so there's a lot of internal organ damage. Um, there's a lot of internal bleeding. And that kept them from beginning any surgical procedures on me. Um, they kept uh, pouring blood in the top, so to speak, because it kept running out and leaking out. And uh, 
before they got all of the uh, bleeding stopped, they used 55 units of blood uh, to transfuse into me. And then because of, even though the airbag on my vehicle had deployed and activated, uh, my head hit the steering column so hard that the steering wheel is kind of bent around the sides of my head, and so there was a lot of breakage and fracturing to my skull. And um, so it was interesting. The doctors did uh, uh, basically a facial reconstructive uh, surgery on me and um, discovered that uh, one of the many consequences uh, was that I would be permanently and completely blind for the rest of my life. Um, that was obviously uh, a key part of the recovery process because it was not just physical, but also very, very emotional. I had um, close head trauma. Um, I had punctured lung, um, several broken ribs, both bones in this arm were broken, and my femur and my hip and both of my ankles were crushed. Um, they told me I would never walk again. A surgeon reconstructed my ankles and reset my hip. And um, then I spent the next four and a half months in a wheelchair because I couldn't put any weight on my ankles. I also couldn't put any weight through this arm because of the plates they had to put on the bones had to heal. And, um, and then I got to start learning to walk all over again. I also woke up to an entirely new life. I had lost um, my husband and the child we were expecting. And um, so I had to start all over again and um, deal with the grief and the loss and rebuild my whole life. There's not just one solution to drinking and driving, and there are many opinions on what measures should be taken. What measures do you think should be taken to prevent drinking and driving? I feel like there are no easy answers, and I don't know what the answer is, but you can't really stop somebody from getting behind the wheel and lowering the level. I didn't feel like was necessarily going to have a big impact. Um, I think the biggest thing we can do is just education. But even just getting the word out by doing things like this um, is probably the most important step that you can take. I think there are some restrictions that can and should be placed on purchasing, on consumption of alcohol. What I'd like to end this question with is something like this. Watch your thinking. Watch your thoughts, for they become your words. Watch your words, for they become your actions. Watch your actions, for they become your habits. Watch your habits, for they become your character. And watch your character, for it becomes your destiny. And for those in high school right now, early college age, tremendous opportunity to set those habits that will determine your character and ultimately